So very quickly, um, first of all, the best part's coming, so we're going to be very short, because the key is going to be what these guys have to say. But let me give you one minute origins of the book. So in 2012, I published a book called Talking Back to Facebook, uh, which, which, even though it's not a great book, was right. And you can imagine what it said. You always diminish your book. I know, I that's because I'm with you. I know, a important. real author. A real author. I thought it was really um, important. Thank you for saying that. Because then Dave wrote a really great book about this called The Circle, uh, which I'm sure many of you read. Um, and, and we had already known each other. Dave started a, let me just, I'm going to introduce Dave. Because this is why we love Dave Eggers. So Dave Eggers, you all know him for his writing. But I started Common Sense in 2003. He started 826 Valencia in 2002. And at the time, he was one of the most important authors in the United States. He had a burgeoning uh, author, a career as a writer. He was, he'd already, you'd started McSweeney's by then. And then he got the idea that you should create a program first here in San Francisco to help kids who would never otherwise have an opportunity to train to be great writers. And he built it in a pirate shore on, uh, on, at 826 Valencia. Right? Here, here's, what, here's what you need to know about Dave. You all know what an unbelievable author he is. You, know how, you also know how incredibly creative he is. Just read his books and how he comes up with the monk of mocha. Anyway, how he comes up with these ideas and then writes brilliant books about them is amazing. But the truth is, he's an unbelievable nonprofit leader and humanitarian. He started 826 Valencia. He then turned it into 826 National. He started Scholar Match, which has sent you know, hundreds and hundreds of kids to college and paid for their college. He does this all in the middle of his writing career and being a good husband to his extremely talented wife, Vandela, and his kids. So All right, this is an amazing guy, Dave now. Eggers. All right. But come on. So come on. Um, the point is, Jim and I met at Common Sense one day, and f talking back to Facebook had come out, and I really liked it. And I thought, why don't we have the students themselves, who are most affect by, affected by the technologies that, uh, that Jim was discussing, speak out and write about their own experiences. And we've been doing this for 17 years. We have students write about the issues that are most important to them. We let them speak with their authentic voices and we publish them in professionally uh, bound, you know, professional quality books that can stand the test of time, be um, taught, be in public libraries, be available to the world. And so uh, Joel Arquios, who is the head of 826LA, former social studies teacher at Galileo High School in San Francisco, um, yeah, good applause for Gal. And um, Joel uh, heads up an enormous organization in LA that serves thousands of kids down there, 826 LA. And he edited this book and put it together, the voices of students from all over the country, with the purpose of having high schoolers give advice to middle schoolers, basically. It, 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 that was the loose idea. What would you tell your younger siblings, younger kids at your school? What, what, it, what have you learned in your vast experience as teenagers about what to do, what not to do, strategies to you know, navigate the digital world? And so these essays are incredibly candid. They are very practical and all with the idea to sort of like uh, help their fellow young people manage their uh, digital selves. And so to that end, Let's bring them up because that sounds great. it's so much more important to hear from them Can I make one than point? us. Can I make one point as we bring them up? All right. Which is when we look at the work we do at Common Sense, you know, we have this large consumer platform, large education platform that you heard Kelly and Merv describe, largest kids advocacy group in the country. But you know, at the end of the day, when we think about the issues we talk about at Common Sense, we think that the people who are ultimately going to solve them and come up with the solutions are young people. The people who grew up with these platforms, who were raised on these platforms, and who will ultimately shape the future in a better way than some of the adults have done. Yeah. Anyway, <laughs> let's move over. All this right, way. we'll go over here. Um, all right. Come, come on, on up. up. Come on up. And I'll. Uh...
So um, right to my left, this is Sian, who just graduated uh, high school, and she participated in 826 Valencia's programs. She was a, published in a total of four books while she was a student. She became an editor for the Best American Non-Required Reading. Do you guys know this collection that I used to edit with the help of high school students? And, um, and then the, the editor of the book, when Sian was part of it, was a former student in the class. He took it over uh, when I retired. How, how great is that for continuity? That's Daniel Gumbiner, who also was a finalist for the National Book Award last year, um, who I knew since he was 13. So how's, how great is that? She will soon begin her sophomore year, sophomore year at Berkeley and looks forward to pursuing her passion for science and a good cup of tea. Uh, Sian's essay is incorporated into the Common Sense Digital Citizenship Curriculum. Sian, a round of applause. <laughs> um, next to Sian is Angelica, who's a 14-year-old who grew up in the heart of the Tenderloin District of San Francisco. In school, she's about to start high school in the fall, and in school she enjoys learning about math and science, since those are two of her favorite subjects. In the future, she doesn't know how exactly what profession she or job she wants, but she does know she wants to be someone who makes a difference in this world. Angelica? Hi. Next to her is Huyan, is a current eighth grader, and he's going into uh, high school next year. His hobbies consisted of playing video games, reading, and writing. He is very passionate about the earth and how he can change it for the better. Hu Yan. Yeah. Um, Annie graduated from Galileo, Annie. And uh, as a high school student, she took part in a summer internship with 826 Valencia and went on to become one of their 2018 scholarship winners. She is now a sophomore in college, majoring in biology with a molecular cell biology concentration, and is passionate about creating changes at the smaller levels of life, which can help make the world a better place for everyone and everything in it. How's that for ambition? And to Annie's left is Cam. You should introduce okay, Cam. So last was. but not least is our friend Cameron Kasky, who is now a fellow at Common Sense Media who's working on news literacy, and I just told him he's going to work on our campaign to stop Jewel in San Francisco and around the United States. Not the singer. No, Jewel, the pods that you're well, all smoking well, in Well, 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 let's think about that. No, anyway. no, no. <laughs> anyway, so, so we love Cam for that, but what we really love him for is he is the co-founder of March for Our Lives. And he is, and, and last year, and last year at the Common Sense Media Awards, we honored Cameron and March for Our Lives at, at, for the extraordinary work that they have done, that he has done personally, and oh, that he no. and his friends have done to wake up the United States to the challenges and horrors of gun violence, which they all lived through in a way that hopefully none of us ever have to live through. And it's interesting, because we had asked, I would asked Will Ferrell, who stars in our device-free dinner campaigns, by the way, just to preview, we're going to now do device-free bed. That's the next version of device-free dinner. It is. Wait till you see how good those spots will be. But uh, we asked Will Ferrell to co-host the evening here in San Francisco. And he said, OK, I'll come up. But what I really want to do is give the award to Cameron Kasky and March for Our Lives, which shows you what these guys have done. So welcome, Cam. We'd love to have you here with everybody else. And he's an actor. He's not shy. <laughs> um, well, I'll start with you, Sion, since you're right next to me. You were asked, the prompt was writing about sort of something that you've learned. Yeah. And you had an experience at a, at a middle school, as a middle schooler, that was a bit harrowing. And it sort of goes to a lot of the issues that we're talking about. And I wonder if you can sort of describe what happened and what you learned from it. Right. So about five years ago, I was 13, and I was in middle school. And there was this one girl who had been bullying me for three years, so my entire middle school career. And we would just kind of exchange remarks in the hallways. It would be you know, snarky little things, but nothing serious, because I, I think I was more confrontational about it, because as most people would, I did not enjoy having someone say things behind my back. I thought, you know, if you're going to say something, say it to my face, and I'll say something back. Or something else will happen, you know. But 
So she, she didn't really like to do any face-to-face -face things. She would just kind of whisper to her friends or someone else something bad about me, like a lot of middle schoolers do. <laughs> but the night before our graduation, um, a mutual friend of ours on Instagram, we had blocked each other, so we couldn't see each other's posts, <laughs> as, as you do. Uh, he had posted a picture of her, himself, and someone else, and the girl had commented um, underneath, I look so ugly, LOL, you know, to garner compliments, as many young people do, by attempting to say that you look ugly when you don't. <laughs> and so I had commented, I thought it was my friend who had captioned it that, not her, and I had said something like, oh, you sound just like the girl, and then we started going back and forth on Instagram, and instead of little remarks in the hallways, these were paragraph texts with pretty deep insults, and the last one that she said to me was, I hope you go home and kill yourself. And even though it was five years ago, it really stuck with me, and I, was, I just looked at the posts um, after she commented that, and I was like, okay, I'm done, I just want all of it to go away, I don't want to see this ever again which didn't happen because A, I was not the person who posted it. So about a month later, it was taken down along with all of the terrible comments that we had posted. Um, however, my mother had screenshotted what she said to me on Instagram and printed out physical copies. So the piece that I wrote um, in our book is just kind of a warning to young people on social media because especially now with Snapchat where we have 10 seconds, 10 second stories, you think it can just disappear and if someone takes a screenshot, maybe we'll just delete it. It's, it's not the reality. People print things out and there's just other ways that circulate, so you should be careful of what you post because it might not always disappear. I still have the physical copies to this day. Um, my mother was thinking she might show it to the principal or so the, her high school, like it would follow us later in life. It wasn't just a one-off thing on Instagram. It was, it's gonna stay forever now, so be careful. How did that resolve itself at school, your relationship? Was it reported to the principal? Did you go was there any resolution with you and this other student? No, there, it wasn't. It was the night before graduation, so I think a lot of people didn't think it was that big of a deal. It was just kind of, you know, just two girls in middle school fighting on Instagram. It's going to go away, you know. We're done with this. It's not like it was the middle of the year. Mm. And, yeah, and so nothing happened. many students saw it? Our entire grade saw it. Yeah. Why, they're all on the same thread? Yeah, all, yeah. The person who had posted it initially was a popular kid, so he had most of my... Uh, classmates. Did that affect your relationship with all the, your other peers, people coming up to you saying, I'm so sorry that that happened? Did they make a big deal out of it? Yeah, but it wasn't so much apologizing to me. It was kind of them taking her side because the girl was kind of a queen bee, I guess. But it was a lot she of... She had more social power in the yeah, school, so yeah. she was starting from a more powerful position exactly. and then saying something so horrible. Yeah, it just kind of showed me also that you may think some people are your friends, but when it comes down to it, they won't take your side, and that was just kind of eye-opening to, you know, find some more quality friends. <laughs> and so what would you advise, like, a middle schooler today? I mean, is it a matter of, because if they're on Instagram or on a lot of platforms, you know, you can block people, but obviously they find ways around. What's, what's your advice? My advice is just don't say anything on the Internet that you would not say to this person's face, um, because they're still going to see it, and it's still gonna, they're going to take it to heart. It doesn't matter that it's over these little electronic screens. You're still communicating with someone. Mm. And I would also take into consideration how long it's going to stay up there. Will you still be okay with this showing up in five years, ten years, two years, any amount of time? Because as I say in my, my piece, it doesn't always disappear. You don't know. Mm. Well, it, it overlaps with, um, you know, we read about, and I'm very concerned about, I work with young people, uh, every week, and I've been shocked by the skyrocketing um, rates of teen depression, and they're getting younger, and s things like so suicidal ideation are happening at a younger age, and in part, people are attributing it to the rise of social media and sort of this cyberbullying. Cam, you uh, are so eloquent on this subject, and you've had experiences with the darker side of social media. And I wonder if you could sort of talk about um, yeah, those experiences and sort of how the power of the medium exacerbated um, uh, an issue like that for you. Sure. Um, hey, everybody. I'm Cameron. I'm not only less intelligent than my co-panelists, but also less friendly, so this might not go well. Um, <laughs> teachers, I'm going to give your arms a break. Can you raise your hand if you're part of a tech company that is involved with not only social media, but just tech in general being part of our lives. 
Well, thank you for being here. It's very important for us to keep these conversations going. And I also encourage you not to let them stay in this room because we can't undo the damage that, that these companies have done to my generation. I know that countless suicides, countless horrible mental health issues for young children, including myself, I was suicidal for a while, can very tightly be attributed to the deliberately addictive products that are being peddled to us, like the social media sites, the fact that Apple is, is, is you know, creating these apps that are, that, where they're studying the dopamine that's released in us. It's, it's such a horrible thing, and it's really, it, I call it a, I'm, I'm very dramatic, I was a theater student, I call it mental health genocide, and I'm watching young people fall by the wayside because of these products that are used to exploit the way our brains work. So let's not, let's not let this stay in this room. For those of you who care enough to be here, I'm infinitely grateful, and for those of you who are contractually obligated to do, go where your boss tells you, try, let's do a device-free panel and really listen to this. Um, I have been sent countless death threats I have been sent messages that my developmentally disabled younger brother, they were going to cut up my retard brother and, um, and throw him in a gas chamber because we're Jewish, which I don't know why they would throw him in a gas chamber after cutting him up. He would already be deceased, but that's, that's, you know, that's their own prerogative. They can do whatever they want. Um, and I have also seen myself become so unbelievably codependent with my technology that as I consistently speak in panels and speeches about how addicted we are and how pathetic it is, I also clamor for the moments where I get to check my phone. And right now we are at a turning point. We are at the first point, we're at the first time Gen Z is really becoming adults. Now mind you, adults in body and, and development, not in brain. I'm incredibly immature and I'm 18. Do, do not think that becoming a legal adult makes you an adult. But, I mean, I mean, you learn in the business world, adults are just really tall teenagers, often a little bit more mature and intelligent, but same thing. Um, <laughs> people believe that tech and people believe that social media is real life. People will look at it and take it so seriously. When somebody who is anonymous can say these awful things to young people I know, they look at it as real life. And yet, when they're thinking about the content that they put out, they look at it as a toy. So we're stuck in this horrible medium where the negative things and the things we receive on social media, we treat like they are a real part of our lives, something that we need to take incredibly seriously. And yet the content we put out, we don't take seriously at all. And you see it happen all the time. Our generation is gonna be the kids who, when we're 50 years old, are ripped out of our careers because we were irresponsible on the internet at the age of 16. It's awful, it's pathetic. Can cancel culture is going to really, really ruin a lot of the fabric of our society. And it's important, while it is important to hold people accountable, it's also important to remember that people have been taught to use technology and social media as a toy, and yet these messages that so many people I know are receiving are literally killing us. Cam, can I ask, um, and I just want to commend you on your eloquence, like Cam is uh, pretty incredible on the topic. What is the, because of the level of toxicity that you've personally experienced, what is the risk-reward ratio, would, that you might say, to get on and use some of these platforms that subject you to national, worldwide sort of um, some of these toxic messages from strangers that otherwise would have no access to you? It's, it's neurological slavery. Mm. It's the fact that no matter what we do, we are not going to be able to communicate a message with others unless we're using social media. We have completely fallen for this act. Congratulations, social media platforms. You got us. I'd love to say that I could be done with these social media platforms. Then I don't get work. Then I don't get to reach out to people and encourage them to mobilize behind issues. I am pathetically attached to the platforms that, that, uh, that all of these wonderful companies out here in Silicon Valley have used to ruin my generation. And uh, no offense. I'm, <laughs> I doubt, I, doubt any of you, I doubt any of you came in here with the prerogative of hurting anybody, but we can make a change. We can't undo it, but we can make a change. And I'd say that I was lucky enough to teach myself to find many of the hateful comments toward me objectively funny. Mm -hmm. um, people have gone after my appearance and very often been a little right, but um, people have gone after the way I carry myself. People have attacked the, my, my masculinity or the lack thereof. And people have really gone after people I care about. And what we can do is teach each other not to care, but we can also try and create social media platforms, as Jim so eloquently puts it, as the actual publications that they are. I believe things I see on the internet. And as often as I tell myself not to, I do. So if we change the conversation about it, we can fix it, but I doubt that's gonna happen as long as we're able to make money off of clicks. Well, I wanna, wanna 
come back to you on that. Social media is one thing where you expect a certain amount of feedback. And, you, and, and at this point, everyone's aware of just how toxic it can get. Um, Huyan, you had an experience that's different where you're playing a game. You wrote about playing a game, uh, Roblox? Um, yes. That you'd think that you would be enjoying a game and just, even if you are playing with others uh, around the, the world, it doesn't have to become a, uh, an antagonistic or a toxic place. But tell us what happened with, with you. So I guess around sixth grade, I would say, I was just logging on to play like normal, and I saw a message pop up. So as I clicked on it, I saw it was just a random player. And he said, go to this, account, this website, log in to my username, password, and I'll get free in-game currency. So as I was doing what he told me, I, saw it just, I seemed as the website as kind of suspicious. But I didn't want to think of it as that because I really wanted it. <clears throat> I wanted the in-game currency so bad that I went on and I typed everything that he wanted me to do. And, I w and once I was done, there was also a message that said, go tell my friends about this website and all the good things that would happen. So once I'm done, I just waited for it to happen. And I was also told to reload my page. And once I did, I just saw I was locked out. And this was really surprising to me because I thought I would get the in-game currency, but I didn't. And although this wasn't like big as theft threats or bullying, I could see this as like <clears throat> a threat towards my account and other things that I care about. And I would say that even though these seem realistic and they're, they seem really good for us, they might not do as we thought they will. And yeah. Well, you were 12, is that right, at the time? Um, You're sixth grade? Sixth grade, yes. And so my generation, you get on and you play Centipede, um, <laughs> or Gallagher, or Qbert. There, there was no presumption that strangers from all over the world would be able to reach in and send you messages, um, offers, um, phishing schemes, uh, maybe uh, uh, facilitate identity theft. Does it change the way you interact with gaming? Did you say, you know what, it's, uh, I'm going to go, I mean, just use analog games. I'm going to buy myself an Atari. Um, I've seen some nasty stuff on Pong, I'm telling you. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Pong, yeah, that's a problem. Um, <laughs> Cam, I, uh, I, I go back to Pong. I, uh, I was there for Pong. Can't you play um, it here? But, but Huyan, like, what, how did that change your interaction? Did it change your behavior? So after that happened to me, I felt really scared. Like, what if he goes after my other accounts and my social medias? Yeah. Like, what if he knows where I live and like that? So I didn't want to tell my parents at first because I was scared I might get in trouble. Then as like, time went on, I saw that I should tell them because things might go really bad and I should prepare for it. So then I told them and nothing really bad happened. Did they, what, did, what was their uh, uh, advice or did they alter your access or? Um, my mom didn't do, like, she didn't take anything away from me, but she just told me to be careful because things might seem too good to be true sometimes. Mm -hmm. And yeah, I agree with her. And I, since then, there are still more offers that come through while you play, you just ignore them. Uh, yes, they're like voices, I guess, but then I just like, try to ignore them. And although they might happen to like my brother, I just also tell him to ignore it because I know what. And, and Huyan, what age did you first have a social media account? Um, I was around fifth grade, I think. What did you go on? I was on Facebook a lot and maybe Instagram a little. In fifth grade. Mm -hmm. And now? I just go on Instagram. Instagram. How many of you have Facebook accounts now? Um, can you repeat that? How All many right. of you use your Facebook accounts? <laughs> yeah. I've been trying to have my data stolen so people can get to know me better, and I've been, Facebook has been wonderful for that. <laughs> um, I just use it to talk to my relatives over the seas, like my granddad and my grand, that's it. My, yeah. <laughs> my old relatives. Yeah. <laughs> and to your grandfather's you, social media. No offense yeah. to anyone that, who has a Facebook but, and, do, and you guys know that the official rule is you're not allowed in, under 13, right? But what if yeah. you want to use a platform for the alt-right? <laughs> no rules. Okay. No rules. Um, Angelica, you wrote a great essay about 
a day that the Wi-Fi was down yeah. and how that changed your life. You want to talk about that? So basically, every weekend or every day, I'd always spend my time on technology, watching anime, binge watching Netflix shows. But this one day, the Wi-Fi went down, so I wasn't able to do any of that. So I guess I finally decided to go out and actually enjoy my time with my friends. <laughs> which is, yeah, because I enjoy hanging out with my friends, but mostly we'd be on the phones together. At, when we have sleepovers, you expect that we talk face to face, but mostly we're just on our phones. Like she can be two feet away from me, but we'd be texting on Instagram about a meme we saw. So that's how it usually goes. But uh, at this certain day, I went to the park and there was, I guess all my friends were there and I really did enjoy my time because I was able to enjoy my, the presence of them. Cause um, usually I said, I said before, I'm always on my phone. So just being out there with my friends and hanging out with them was really a good time. And to be off my phone, it's just like, it just awoke, like I was woke basically. <laughs> 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 so like from now on, I'm trying my best to stay out of Instagram, but technology is always there and I do use it for homework. So it's hard trying to get off of it, you know? Can we talk about that for a second? Um, Cause, um, I've been seeing this more and more with young people that I talk to who um, are not on Facebook and some of them who have deliberately said or they're uh, prevented in their homes from using social media because of some of the dangers and they don't use technology that much but come middle school so much of their homework is online um, and some of it which I've seen is not inherently doesn't require technology but the assignments are posted online, updates are posted online, all of these things. So the kids that don't want to use the technology are brought into it and they have to use the technology. So you talk about that a little bit about you had this sort of tech Sabbath, you know you're away from it, but then you sort of get pulled in again just to do your homework. So like I said before, our school, we use Chromebooks and it's a really good learning tool because our teachers are able to post assignments online and we can easily email them about a question on an assignment. But like I said before, the Chromebooks can be a big distraction, especially for middle schoolers because in our school we have this like extension now. They added it recently called Go Guardian. They basically sp spy on what we do because some of the younger grades, they are like kind of foolish and they decide to search up stupid things on the Chromebooks so that like limited our use of what to search up online when really we're just trying to use it, but yeah. yeah. Some of these younger kids may be too young to, for, to have that access, do you think? Yeah, because yeah. we go from fourth to eighth grade and the fourth graders use it a lot. The fourth graders are given Chromebooks. <laughs> oh boy, all right. <laughs> Um, boy, I have so many opinions right now that I'm gonna. Um, so, I'll just say, how many of you guys are educators? All right, I, you know, I've been going through this firsthand now, and I have strong opinions. And 826 Valencia, for 17 years, most of the work we do, it's in support of teachers. All we do is we support what the homework is that the teachers assign. So if kids need extra help, especially ELL kids, we're there to make sure that they understand the material that the teachers have given them. And almost, I'd say 98% of the work that we do after school in our centers is paper and pencil. And there's rooms of these beautifully quiet, buzzing, happy places with kids, volunteers, and paper and pencil. And, um, and I think that up to a certain grade, paper and pencil is enough and fine. And it's, and it's in sync with how kids learn at that age. And I think increasingly forcing too much homework through this yeah. portal Correct. that is inherently fraught and distracting. It's like trying to do your homework in Times Square in the middle of uh, New Year's Eve and a circus and a hurricane and a tornado all at once. So it's just, I see it firsthand these days and um, uh, I think it's something that we all have to think about. It's like how do we not mix messages and say too much screen time, be careful, at the same time, you have to be on, on the screen to do your homework. That's a problem, and it's a, and it's a, and it's a contradiction that is today that's going on. I totally agree, and yeah. I will tell you this. 
We're obviously with the, you just saw the presentation on digital citizenship. We built that field, 75,000 member schools, 800,000 teacher members. At the end of the day, as a prophet Stanford, I banned laptops and phones in my class. Yeah. Not allowed to have them in the class. You have to write by hand because I do not believe you'll pay attention. And I did that eight years ago and I was teaching with this other person who said, we're gonna get the worst you know, course reviews in the history of Stanford class. I said, who cares? Because they're not paying attention. Yeah. And, even if, and even if, think about that in your guys' classes, because does that happen to you? Because even if you're not on your Instagram page, the person next to you is, so you look at the person next to you, and you, instead of listening to the math problem or the history example or whatever you're supposed to be doing, you're, you're not paying attention. So it's a very interesting dynamic for adults and for educators, because we need computers, and when used appropriately, they're amazing learning tools for personalized learning and everything. But then on the other hand, they can be disastrous from an attention and focus standpoint. So what do you guys think about that? Maybe we should. Well, Ang Angelica, you, yeah. uh, I mean, sorry, Annie. Annie. Annie, um, you talk about Instagram and talk about um, sort of, first of all, talking about the dual selves, your physical self and your Instagram self, but also being present among friends and among family with the Instagram account, with your phone in front of you, and sort of the irony, I guess, that you live with, with technology. Can you talk about that? Um, a couple ironic points. So um, around two weeks ago, um, me and my college friends, we all finished our exams. So it's our first year, and we were just all like getting together to say our final goodbyes, and we were like talking about how like we've made our own family, and it felt like straight from the movies, like it was so sweet. But then after we finished talking, they all went on their phones, and then like it was like five other people, and I was just sitting there like watching them, and then I spoke up, I was like, are you guys gonna talk to me? And then they were like, yeah, just a, just a minute, like I'm checking something. But then after that, they kept checking, so that became like a regular thing. And I thought it was just kind of funny because it felt like there was a wall between us. While they were connecting with someone else on their phones, they could have been connecting with the people right there in front of them. Something else that's, um, that comes to mind is like a few summers ago, I was um, binge watching YouTube, and I was watching um, this YouTuber called Casey Neistat. He does like cool things around New York City, and I was just watching him do these things. But then I realized after that summer, I could have been doing that in San Francisco. <laughs> <laughs> what strategies have you adopted for yourselves? Are there, are, is there a day that you don't use your phone, hours or periods of the day? Anybody that you first, uh, Annie? Um, I don't really restrict myself that much. Um, the most important thing to keep on keep in, in my head is be mindful about why I'm using it, whether it's for homework, talking to a friend, or social media. As long as I'm mindful, I remind myself when, when is a good time to stop and when should I keep going. How about at home with parents? Are there plans, restrictions, strategies that have worked that you have, like not at the dinner table, not after seven, any, not in your bedroom, any rules like that that see on? Well, in my household, we just don't allow it at the dinner table, which I really like, just because that's the one time when my parents are home at the same time, and I'm home, and my sister, so we can just communicate as a family, which I don't get as much since I'm in college and our, all our schedules are conflicting. But for me, I've noticed if I charge it in a different room, if it's on low battery, that kind of helps, just because I do need to charge it. There's nothing I can do about that, but if I can just move the charger to a different room, mm. you know, I'm not hearing it buzzing, I'm not hearing all my notifications, and I can get a little more work done, you know. Just mm. tip from me. <laughs> can, can I ask you guys a follow-up question on that? How many of you, be honest, sleep with your phone, have it in the bedroom with you? <laughs> Put up your hands. And All of you. And how many of you have it in bed with you? <laughs> Only when I'm feeling lonely. <laughs> <laughs> and, and is your excuse because it's an alarm clock? Maybe. Or why do you have it in bed with you? Why do you have your phone in bed with you? Uh, and well, I guess... Usually, I fall asleep using my phone at times, like well, all the times. Um, <laughs> in mid text, like. <laughs> yeah, actually, yeah. though, like my friend would ask, "Are you still up?" I'm like, "Yeah." I'm like, "I'm good," you know. And then <laughs> next thing you know, I just like close my eyes and then I fall asleep. <laughs> and it's like 2 a.m. in the morning, which is really ridiculous, especially if my parents found out about that. So. <laughs> yeah. This is streaming right now, exactly. yeah. <laughs> You're being taped and we're sending it to them right now. Yeah. So, yeah, I don't really restrict myself because it's so hard getting off of it. Because when I use my, like, my phone, I'm just so used to it that 
it doesn't come up in my mind like, oh, I should just stop. No, I just keep going until like when I feel really tired to the point where I just fall asleep using it. How many of you feel like it affects your that number of hours that you get to sleep? I get less than five, I think. Less than five hours? I mean, yeah, that's really bad. You're supposed to be getting like 10 or 11 yeah. at your age. See, I use the excuse of 11. I'm doing homework, but I'm really not because my laptop, the Mac, um, you can do a lot of things to it. One click of a button, you can be watching YouTube videos on Mr. Beast or um, just reading Webtoon. So it's so difficult yeah. trying to control yourself. But that's why I have my mom and my dad trying to control me. But it's hard because I, like, I don't like lying, but I do end up making an excuse. I am doing my homework when really, when really I'm not. Uh, I, I Annie, can, you I were going to say phone. something. I Annie, oh, say. sorry. We'll go Annie and then Cam. So I did notice something, actually. So back then in elementary school, I wouldn't have a phone, so I watched the TV. Whatever program was on, I would watch it. And if it wasn't my favorite, I would go do something else, which is not internet related or device related. But now with my phone, it's portable. It's 24-7 entertainment with the apps I download. So it's more like I don't want to like do anything other than like do this thing because it's full of entertainment. And like after that, my mind, half of my mind like falls asleep. That's why like I think most of us fall asleep with our phones like in our bed because it's just like it's so easy and it like like again it raises our dopamine levels to have that kind of entertainment. Mm. Cam, you know what? I think it's really started to affect my vision. I, I can't. I don't know the studies. I, I can't see them because my vision has gotten so bad. But I'm spending <laughs> I'm spending ten hours a day on my phone. I'm spending ten hours a day on my phone. Now, mind you, that's also because of work I do. But I'm, it's it, there's no excuse. That's a season of Game of Thrones, and. Um, well, seasons one through six, sorry guys. Um, but, but the way that it affects the way that it, I, I'm getting headaches, I, I'm, I'm really falling victim to it. I keep my phone on the nightstand because I have no interest in paying for an alarm clock that will play, put on your Sunday clothes from Hello Dolly to wake me up, or Isn't She Love Me, which is for weekend. Isn't She Lovely, pardon me, Stevie Wonder, anyone? <laughs> um, but it's just every single new phone that comes out has a new innovation that makes it even harder for us to get away from it. Mm. Every single time they've got something new. And it's under the guise of making our lives more convenient. You know, the more, the, the more that Siri can listen to us and, and feed Orwellian garbage into our brain, the more we realize that, that this convenience that has been the narrative of making everything easier for us is a marketing tool. And it's a really good one because I still fall for it no matter how much I talk about it. I've got my AirPods right here. Mm. <laughs> and they were expensive. Um, we should do Q&A? Okay, we've got about 10 minutes, right? And um, yeah. so if there's questions out there, yes, uh, with a uh, woman with the glasses right there in purple, I think. We have 15. Hello, uh, that was very, sorry, that was loud. That was very interesting. Um, you mentioned like new phone models having new things to keep you engaged. Um, the companies have also they say, been introducing things to try and help you manage your phone use. So, like, Apple has time of use things where you can switch it off at 10.30 and it comes back on at 6.45. Have any of you guys used those things? Have you had these discussions with your parents? Is it something that's kind of been part of the picture at all for you? Yeah, so I've used those and a lot of my friends have used the timer just to, you know, get off Snapchat at a certain point and start doing your homework. Unfortunately, it does not work because every time I've spent time with my friends and we were using our phones for homework or something every time, or you know, we're on an app and we're using Instagram or something, and that little message pops up that, hey, you've been on this for like three hours, you should probably get off. Just swipe up and get rid of it. We just, it doesn't really do anything. It's just kind of an annoying reminder that you've been spending a lot of time on your phone rather than a means to get you off of the phone. In my experience, and I feel like a lot of my friends' experiences, at least. Can I just follow up with that? How many of you guys feel, and Cam, I think I know the answer, like that, that your use, of, the, of your phone is not under control. Well, I think that when tech companies use words like engaged, it's a very cute and sugar-coated way of saying addicted. Yeah. So when, when they want to use excuses like saying, oh, we're going to add this feature to show you just how much time you're spending on the screen, I think that that is a very, very weak attempt to get out of the fact that they're keeping us all addicted. Engage, engagement is, is an interpersonal thing. You can be engaged with the people around you. You can be addicted to tech, and that's important. Any of you guys feel like you've got the balance figured out? Nope. No? So, you know, obviously this is 
those of us that grew up with TV, we liked TV, but it, we never felt the same way, I don't think, that it was like completely out of control. And that I've, I've been asking teenagers and college students this question for the last seven years, and it's getting worse every year. Yeah. And never, I used to feel like it was half and half, the students that would say they've got a balance, and now I meet no students that have the balance. That's right. Unless they live in tech-free houses, and then the Waldorf kids seem to have it figured out. But it's like, otherwise, the balance is very hard to attain. And when you guys are so young, I just have to say, I'm livid and outraged that you have to contend with this stuff. Let me ask you guys a follow-up. And Huan, you start. I agree. But I agree. So let me ask a question. So we came out with this sleep survey today, right? <laughs> Screens and sleep. And if I... If we told you, oh, not just once, but like, let's say over a six month period repeatedly, that sleep was incredibly important to how well you did in school, that it was incredibly important to how happy you were, that it was incredibly important to your physical health, and that you could damage your physical health, and that therefore you needed to take an hour before you went to bed, Angelica, and put your phone someplace else. Do you think that if we repeated that message to you enough that you'd listen to that? Probably not. <laughs> okay, tell, and tell me why. Because I feel like technology is like too addictive to us, and it's like a part of us and how we do and go out throughout, go throughout our days. I guess. That's well. um, we have more questions. Yeah, in the gray right there. Yes, that's you. Yeah. Oh, here it's coming. I'm coming. sorry that you were waiting for the mic. That's right. Hi, I was just curious. Um, I know that when I set goals for myself, it's really helpful when other people hold me accountable. So I'm curious if there are ways that your parents or your friends or your teachers could help you find that balance and what those ways might be. Teachers can teach us in class and not give us absurd amounts of homework, I'd say, um, because I don't think that that's a way to engage students. And also, I think that assuming that teenagers will listen to their parents might lead us into some unnecessary, you know, conversations. It's not going to work. I don't listen to my parents. I love them. I don't listen to them. Anyone else? You can definitely switch phones with your friend. Even though you know their password, do you really want to get into the, their business? Maybe you do, but then you're switching the phone for the, like, mentality to, to, for them to stop getting on it. So I feel like if you really care about that friend, like I have this one friend I really care about, that empowers you more to rather to be entertained by, like, her Instagram, who's DMing her, to just like think about her. You're doing this for her, and she could be doing it for you. Mm. Mm. All right, uh, we got a lot of questions, so we'll go. We'll try to be uh, quick. Um, where's the microphone? I'm uh, see if there's anybody there or right next to you, and then we'll come over to this table. Oh. Hi. Yeah. Thank you for all your um, your stories. Thank you for bringing these young people together. It's just great to hear this and to hear Cameron's candid. Remarks. Uh, it's it's really nice to hear. Um, I just have a point. I just saw on Twitter, <laughs> unfortunately, uh, that Nintendo, um, you know, who are one of the aligned with another game company to make the Pokemon Go uh, game, have come out with a game that pushes you to sleep more. So they're they're. I guess to some of the young people's remarks on we can't fight technology, it's just too powerful. I guess one way is to gamify uh, the, 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 the fact that they need to get some sleep, basically. That would be one, one option, I guess. Yeah, I mean, on its surface, it's the most absurd thing <laughs> that humanity has ever invented. Honestly, Pokemon Sleep might do it for us. That might save Gen, Gen Pokemon Z. Sleep, yeah. We got Pokemon it. Pokemon Sleep. This will just have to last longer than one summer, though, so. Yeah. <laughs> Funny. All right. Uh, over back. We were going to come to this table, and yeah. we'll come back around. Real quick, thank you so much for being here. We need to hear your voices. It's so important. Thank you. Um, I'm not familiar with all the details of this, but I know there were two teens who did a study. They fell into it, actually, about uh, putting a cell phone next to two different plants. And they found when the cell phone was by the plant, the plant was dying. So anyway, they did an experiment, and they put one in a room with the cell phone and the other one without. And within like two weeks, that plant with the cell phone was dead, and the other plant was thriving. So are you concerned about your own physical body with having sleeping with the phone? I think there's a big issue there as well. Um, Angelica. <laughs> so 
Uh, yeah, I see this a lot in news, especially in the morning, because I watch morning news, and they t always talk about how having a phone right next to your bed or near you can damage your health um, if you sleep with it. And I don't know why, but I just never listen to it, because um, maybe it's because it, I don't, it hasn't happened to me. Hopefully it didn't. But I guess uh, hearing, I, yeah, I get that. I hear that a lot about in the news. I should really start listening to it. Maybe, yeah, actually, I will actually commit to it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, after all of this, I've learned a lot about how technology is really bad for you. I just never took it into consideration because uh, I just don't know, you know, but I'll take a chance. They beat, I mean, they beat us. They won. We figured out all the things this does to us, and yet we're all going to be in line for the next product. And congratulations, Apple. Congratulations, social media companies. We lost. And it, but then again, with all this tech stuff, you can also realize that with what we're eating, with the deodorant we're putting on, we're all going to probably have cancer by the time we're 40. Um, <laughs> I might raise your hand if I'm wrong. <laughs> Thank you, Jim. <laughs> Were you going to say something, Sia? Yeah, I mean, we did lose. There's not a lot you can do to fight it. But I think if you have young children and you're just beginning to introduce cell phones to them or things that give off those waves, you need to start, you just need to tell them as soon as they get it where to put it. Because I know with my parents, so I always keep my phone on airplane mode and far away from my bed, even though it is in my bedroom. And when I carry it, it's never in my pockets because my mom is always like, it's going to hurt your organs. So now it's just kind of ingrained, like put it in your yeah. purse or something else. But it's because she was telling me from the moment I got a phone in, in seventh grade. So... I think it helps if you just kind of tell children the minute they get it just do, with certain habits because, you know, minimize the damage, I guess. That's all we can do at this point. Knowing <laughs> what you know now, when would you give a, a, your younger self a phone, if, if at all? Cam? I, I, I don't know, to be honest with you. Okay. I was never responsible with my device. I still am not responsible with my, responsible with my device. Depending on the, how advanced the technology is, is important to me. I'm happy to give a fourth grader a flip phone for safety purposes, but you know the, the, the garbage that they're peddling out, yeah, exactly, man. The garbage that they're peddling out right now, I don't believe anybody should be allowed to touch, and yet I need it, so yeah. OK, Annie? Sorry. What age would you give your younger self a phone, or if you if you, when you're a parent, what age is the right age, if at all? Um, I'd probably give them a phone, like a flip phone for safety, but I don't know when I would give them like a, f a smartphone, you know, one that is, is like so open to like internet and technology, just because like it is scary when you're like little and then it's hard to like not, like what um, she was saying over there, it's hard to not go on your phone even though you hear that it's bad because we usually get phones when we're teenagers, and like peer pressure is like a real thing. So if you see your friends drinking, using drugs, whatever they're doing, if they're sending memes, you're gonna be sending memes. And it's just like something that we don't look at, but it's like very real. And like I see it every day. So I don't know when I would give my younger self a phone, mm. actually. Okay, Huyan. Um, I don't think I should ever give myself like an iPhone, <laughs> but maybe I'll stick with like a flip phone for safety. Mm. <laughs> And at what age would you give yourself an iPhone? You're not even ready for it yet, right? I don't think I'll ever be ready for it. Yeah. <laughs> I would take it away I'm from gonna my hook you up. Self. I'm going to hook you up. I know a guy who sells these. <laughs> um, Angelica? Hmm. Well, I think there's a lot of um, stuff to, like, especially Apple iPhone, because my, cousin, my cousin's parents does this to him. There, you can put, like, a timer on it, like, from... 8 a.m. to like 9 p.m. It'll, av after those times, it will turn off the Wi-Fi so that he cannot use it at all, or there'd be a limit to how long you can use this app. So maybe like around age, maybe around my age right now, because it's especially important for them to have communication-wise, especially because they're going to be out a lot and if they're going to do any projects or anything. So if I gave him a phone, it had restrictions on it, but throughout the years, I, uh, if they learn from it, I take it off when, they feel, when I feel like they're resp responsible. Yeah, and Sian? Yeah, so I agree with what most people are saying. The flip phone, I think, is kind of nece necessary for you know, contacting your parents if you're little. You know, if you get lost, you can just call them, which I think, safety-wise, good choice. However, for just like touch phones, iPhones, tablets, and all those things, I don't. I would not give myself that in middle school. Um, I work with kids for one of my for my job, and I see a lot of like 
four, five, six-year-olds with tablets already just playing video games. And I think it really dulls the imagination because um, when I was that age, I, in the same like, location, I teach gymnastics and the kids are little gymnasts, but I, at the same facility when I was that age, um, I would build little stick houses outside for like fairies with my friends. And I've noticed a lot of the other kids when they're waiting for their parents will just play something on their iPad. And it's just so strange to me. And I think it's really harmful. So I wouldn't give my younger self, I think, an iPhone um, until high school when I'd have to work for it. It wouldn't be just a given. It would have to be a privilege, I think. So I have one last question for you guys. So how much of you guys loved 826 Valencia? Put up your hand. OK. And how much do you love this guy for starting yeah. 826? Um, Listen, we, we ran out of time. There's a lot of other questions. I don't know if you guys will run into each other in the hallways. Um, Any time that we're talking about technology with young people, young people have to be front and center speaking their minds, right? And so um, this, uh, this book that Jim and Common Sense helped makes, make possible, so I want to thank you guys and for the platform that you're bringing and all the audience that you bring with it. I'm so glad to, that you educators and other influencers are out there can take a look at it. It's a primer. It's a start. These guys, all their voices are in it. And I hope that we, we're going to continue to Absolutely. put their voices on the Common Sense platforms and keep this conversation going. It is at such a critical and terrifying moment. And you guys scared me much more than I thought I would be scared <laughs> already. Um, but uh, let's do what we can as adults and teachers and people right. in positions and power to ease the, their stress, to, uh, to give them a little bit of respite from the screens, to like listen to them with these issues. Um, I think that we all who care about their mental health have a lot to do, and we've got to be more cognizant of it and more proactive and think, like, how do I contribute to this? How can I help? this problem because we have a lot of kids that are struggling with it who are otherwise brilliant, eloquent, f future leaders that we need to take care of. So I want to thank you guys so much for speaking out, for being here. Let's give them a round of applause. <laughs>